Salve a tutti e benvenuti a una nuova puntata di Come Don Quixote incontra. Io sono Giulio Bona. Oggi abbiamo un ospite assolutamente eccezionale, creatore di The Corbett Report, che sin dal 2007 manda informazioni di, eh, di giornalismo indipendente. Abbiamo con noi oggi il grande James Corbett. Welcome James, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me here, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's get, let's get immediately started, uh, James. Uh, can I dare question before, preliminary question? Uh, have you ever been inter interviewed by an Italian journalist before? I am racking my brain. I don't recall ever being interviewed by an Italian journalist. So okay, you may be my first. Okay, just to gloat a little bit of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started immediately. Uh, very simple. Can I have uh, a give short introduction about who you are, of course, for the Italian people? Uh, with, what's your background, uh, your career? You know, uh, how did you become uh, James Corbett with over around 600,000 sub subscribers you used to have on YouTube? I remember. Used I was to, one of yeah. <laughs> used to, yeah, that's the correct word. So yeah, can you yeah. give a hint about yourself and your work, please? Thank you. Sure. My name is James Corbett. I am a Canadian. I was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I spent my entire childhood there, grew up there, went to university there. I went to uh, Dublin, Ireland to study for a year in uh, for a master's degree in Anglo-Irish literature. And after that, I went to Japan to start teaching English. And originally, I came here for one year. It ended up being, well, so far, 18 years and counting. So I obviously felt quite at home in, in Japan and ended up staying here and starting a family. In that time, uh, when I came to Japan, I suddenly started encountering information online that I had never seen before in my education or in my reading. I considered myself a politically aware person and someone who read and thought about politics, but there was a lot of information that I was finding online that I had never seen before and not just crazy conspiracy theories from crazy conspiracy theorists, but since this is the online age, I could see direct source documents from the National Security Archives in the United States and other places that was proving some of these crazy conspiracy theories that I was reading about. So at that time in 2006 and 2007, when I first started getting into this information, uh, I was very, very aware of the discrepancy between the information I was reading online and what I had been taught my whole life. And so my initial inclination was to try to get this information out to other people. And since this is the online age, the best way to do that, for, according, or at least it seemed at the time, the best way to do that was to start a website, start a podcast. So I had never in my life imagined I would be doing this type of work, but I just felt compelled to do it. So I started it up and started going. And uh, if you listen to my very, very first episodes and interviews, It was atrocious. I didn't know how to speak properly in front of a microphone. Uh, the recording quality was terrible. Uh, it wasn't very well organized, etc. But I just learned on the fly and I just kept doing it over and over and over. So now I am 15 years into the website. I've been doing it 11 years full time as my full time job, um, supported by people out there who listen. And that is basically my entree into journalism. I still don't know exactly what word I would use to describe myself um, because I write and produce and, uh, and, and create these podcasts, but I don't know. Uh, journalist seems like a, a different paradigm, perhaps, than what I'm doing. I'm certainly a writer, an editor, uh, a journalist of sorts, um, someone who really is uh, a keen adherent to the idea of open source intelligence. I always try to put in links to everything that I'm talking about so that people can see where I'm getting my information and then go check it for themselves. And so I'm a podcaster slash journalist slash editor slash commentator. And that's what I've been doing for 15 years now. Well, that, that resembles basically the job of a journalist, if you think about it. I mean, it's not just a, a person, uh, you think, uh, on a typewriter, you know, in the dark with a cigarette in the, in the mouth. It's a, it's a, it's a wide span uh, kind of job. You can do many things. Today, in the information age, as you said, of course, you need a website. It's something that is very reachable and easy to, to, to get. I think your website is amazing. It's very simple and has a lot of good information. Actually, this video I watched a, a few days ago, and I will translate it later for the Italian people. It's very nice and uh, explains also what you just explained to us, basically. Okay, thank you so much for that. Okay, let's move to the hot topic, unfortunately. The hot topic, uh, the big elephant in the room is 
war between Russia and Ukraine. Okay, now there is an ongoing propaganda, basically. There is from mainstream media uh, portraying Putin as a new Hitler, uh, Zelensky, the savior of uh, you know the partisan defending the country, the, the fatherland. Uh, but I think the reality is not that simple. You actually wrote uh, an article, a beautiful article I've read. I put it here. Give me one second. This article explains in detail the history about uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia situation. I will translate it later for the Italian public as well. Uh, here you put the start of the clock because as you resemble in this beautiful image, the mainstream media is portraying basically this part of the picture. Only the last day. Basically, the mainstream media, and they are saying it actually in Italy and everywhere, uh, Putin woke up in the morning saying, Ukraine is evil and I need to kill it. Out of the blue, without any provoke, uh, provocation or uh, anything. And for example, it's a very good point. Uh, you you start here to go back in the time. It's, uh, it's a clever article because uh, you discover the history, how, it, how much it's complex complex it's not simple you cannot define it just with the good guy and the bad guy it's absolutely ridiculous the first point here i would like to point out and then i will leave you the, uh, to talk about it if you want uh, uh, when ukrainian president zelensky declared that wanted to became a nuclear power united states uh, considered this threat always as a reason to, you know, engage war with another country. Let's think about North Korea, Libya, Iran. So just uh, five days before there was a, a possible, plausible excuse, one, I mean, uh, can I have your, your, I mean, your idea about your research about it, please? Yes. So I think it is extremely important to understand the historical uh, context of what is happening right now. Um, and that article, I try to gesture to some of the context that at the very least helps to explain what the Russian uh, response is to, because this is not just something that happened out of the blue. This is a response to certain things that have been going on. That is not to justify this response. That is not to say that military aggression is the answer here, but it is at the very least to explain it, because as you point out, the propaganda tool of the propagandists for the last 75 years has been to call absolutely any enemy of the U.S. State Department in particular, but of the Western world or NATO in general, as Hitler. And of course, it always goes back to that touchstone because this is just the unquestionable evil person who is a madman, who is just a tyrant that is only interested in blood and power, and that's it, and that there's no explanation necessary Therefore, you call your opponent Hitler. That just means they are evil and need to be eradicated from the face of the planet. No questions asked. It's a very convenient rhetorical tool. And we've seen that reflected in um, memes that go around online right now that everyone I disagree with is literally Hitler. And that's essentially, that is just the rhetorical tactic right now. So it is a disservice to ourselves if we play into that and don't look for the actual motivations of people involved here. So this article was an attempt to paint some of that context and history. So for example, as you point out, just two days before the announcement of the declaration or the, the acknowledgement of the uh, DPR and L LPR, the, the new republics in the Donbass, before that acknowledgement, just two days at the Munich Security Conference, the Ukrainian president was announcing that Ukraine was going to start seeking the nuclear capability, nuclear power, uh, which nuclear weapons, I should say, which is, I mean, obviously a, a blatant violation of the Budapest Memorandum of 1994 and, and all of the assurances that Russia has been given over the years. But perhaps if you go further back in history to document nothing new, because of course, there are infamously, uh, there were any number of assurances that were given in the 1990, 1991 period as Germany started to reunify that, don't worry, NATO will not expand to the east. We will not move one inch to the east. That assurance was given over and over and over by many different diplomats representing many different NATO countries. That was obviously broken very quickly. And uh, NATO started its advance further and further east. And of course, the specter of Ukrainian membership in NATO has been floated in recent years. So that clearly, I mean, 
obviously plays into what is happening right now. Again, this is not to justify what is happening right now, simply to explain it. And as I go farther back in that article, you can see that history really is, I think, the defining question here. And how you see that history and which parts of the history you look at uh, and how you interpret those pieces of history are the defi deciding factor in how you understand what is happening right now. And I point out that Putin, very interestingly, last, I believe it was last year, penned an article about the history of Ukraine and how Ukraine is part of traditional uh, greater Russian ethnic heritage and that the Ukrainian state, as we know it today, only came into existence because of Vladimir Lenin and 1918 and various uh, things that were happening at that time, which is a history that Putin wrote and uh, presumably actually believes, or at least is using as a justification for why Russia needs to be so protective of Ukraine, uh, as they would say it. Um, but obviously Ukrainians, or at least some Ukrainians, would have a very different reading of that history. Uh, essentially, you're trying to an annihilate our national independence. You're trying to say that we are not a real nation state, but we are, and we are not part of Russia. So there are valid points to be made on both sides of this, but we do a disservice when we simply say Putin is Hitler and therefore he's a madman and there's no explanation needed as to what's going on right now. Exactly. And there was a, an expression made by Leo Strauss, I guess. There was a reductio ad Hitlerum. It's mm -hmm. a Latin version yeah. of uh, basically the strategy of, uh, you know, destroy the credibility of any person, just making them as Hitler. And that's an easy way of propaganda, using propaganda. Actually, speaking of which, I want to show you something from Italian television, something. Uh, so I just start from here. TG2, just to give you some context, uh, is our one of the main national TV news. OK, and they are talking about Ukraine. And uh, as you can see, these images are true. And these images are a video game. Apparently, uh, this is a true image, and that's the journalist. Ah, you were talking about journalists before. <laughs> that's a journalist, apparently. Uh, well, I don't like to be <laughs> compared to these kind of people. Sorry, I am very... Uh, I don't like it. Uh, so, uh, what's, uh, I heard that it, Italy wasn't just the only country when they show also video games uh, seen a war, and... Uh, there were people, you know, saying, oh, my God, how could you... <laughs> These people playing this game, I mean, they would they would know, I mean, eventually. And uh, actually, a guy, uh, a guy that published a phone call, they called the, the news uh, station to ask about it. And they say they were like, uh, oh, my God, I did a mistake. Uh, we have no information from Russia. Russia, evil, evil, evil Russia, evil Russia is closing down a channel. And uh, it's like pathetic excuse uh, for me. I don't know. It's uh, why we're seeing these displays. Why? Uh, we have entered the what has been referred to as the post-truth age, or uh, it's been referred to a number of different ways. But essentially, we are at the point in history where uh, the... Uh, gatekeepers of information uh, have the, the floodgates on the gatekeeping of information has opened. And whereas in the late 20th century, the media paradigm had uh, and the old media entities had consolidated to the extent that a few people essentially were able to control most of what everyone heard, read and saw on a daily basis. We have now transitioned into the 21st century where everyone has a TikTok account and an Instagram account and a Twitter and whatever, and can connect, connect to people all around the world instantly. So that creates a completely different information space than what we were living in even just two decades ago. What that means for would-be propagandists is that it is not... Uh, one can imagine, say, cast your mind back to the, the first Gulf War back in 1990, 91. Uh, it was relatively easy to control what people were hearing and seeing about that war at all times. Nothing was going to get on, say, CNN in the United States that wasn't approved by the Defense Department one way or another, essentially. And yeah. even into the Iraq War of 2003, 2002, 2003, we, we, there was still that sort of information control um, that was possible in the television newspaper world. That isn't really possible in 2022. So the 
the information control takes a different form. And in this case, it is flooding these social media channels with some things that may be true, some things that are true, some things that are completely fabricated, some things that are partially fabricated. It is, uh, uh, we are now living the fog of war that has always assaulted military planners and people operating in space. What is happening? What just happened? Who was that? What, did, uh, did we do that? Who did they do that? And so that creates monumental confusion, which I suppose to be the most generous we can possibly be to the the supposed journalists of the mainstream media who air video game footage as real footage, they too are operating in this space where certain things are floating around on social media. And I guess the question is, do you ignore them completely? Or do you wait until every piece of footage has been 100% verified? Or do you just air it and say, this is what people are saying about what's happening right now. And unfortunately, they are going with the latter, which means that they are airing fake news stories, um, yeah. demonstrably fake news stories. Um, unfortunately, that leaves us, people like yourself or myself, who are hundreds or thousands or 10,000 kilometers away from what is happening with no ability, none whatsoever to really sort out the truth from the fiction, at least not in every case. There are certain things that we'll see that we will not know if they are really happening or how they're being presented. Now that I guess could be an opportunity that we could use to reflect on the nature of mediated reality and how much of our experience these days is really coming through screens that we do not have direct access to most of the information that we have about the world right now. And what does that mean? How can we best try to verify and triangulate information? Unfortunately, I think not a lot of people are thinking so deeply and philosophically about this and are simply looking at video game footage and taking it for real. And they're hoping it's going to pass, you know, the people is going to is going to buy it. Uh, so and they rely on the stupidity, unfortunately, of the people mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the silence of the people. Actually, uh, yeah, uh, about this very topic, uh, I you reminded me of the of a. Um, an interesting uh, uh, documentary I've seen about the World War, the, the first Gulf War in 1991, about the the strategy of censorship through flooding, flooding of information. And I remember back then I was 11, I was 10 when when it was uh, the the Desert Storm uh, War against the new Hitler, Saddam Hussein. And I still remember that every detail of the U.S. Army was broadcasted. But for example, also even they were drinking Evian. Uh, water, my sister. Uh, oh my God! The U.S. Army is so cool. They drink avian water. Why do you know this? Why? <laughs> What's the point? And uh, that's uh, in this article. In this article, in this documentary, they were mentioning also about. They were talking about the Hill and Norton uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, company. They were basically structuring the whole uh, uh, campaign of demonizing of Saddam Hussein. Uh, the babies uh, out of the incubators. We forgot. Uh, the the lady the lead, uh, the the young lady that was the the daughter of the ambassador I think of Kuwait I mean it was a strict she was strictly uh, connected with the administration of Kuwait so uh, it's terribly fishy terribly fishy also this situation today is I I can see the exactly. same exactly and and what you speak to is the type of power that used to exist in that consolidated media environment where everything was being seen through the TV and newspapers exactly. which were controlled by a few companies so that they could do transparently ridiculous propaganda moves like that putting the Kuwaiti ambassador Naira up as a nurse from Kuwait exactly. and babies from incubators taken completely at face value and repeated over and over and over throughout the buildup and the waging of that war turns out to be completely a fabrication by a literal advertising agency, Hill and Knowlton, as you say. Exactly. Um, and we now know about that way, well after the fact that it could have made any actual difference to people's opinions about that war. Um, it, it's just a, it's a nice way of illustrating that war is always, always, always preceded and proceeded by propaganda. And we have to understand that to realize that whatever we are seeing is coming in a specific context and being presented to us in a specific way from a specific viewpoint. And until we really understand that, because unfortunately, some people still cling to the idea that there is some sort of journalistic objectivity and some journalists are floating on a cloud and are simply presenting the truth and you, you decide. 
Um, until we get past that and realize that all information is being presented in a narrative from a particular viewpoint, we will not be able to progress further with our understanding of what's really happening in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree 100%. Your article, for example, you mentioned that there are two uh, main teams, uh, Team NATO and Team BRICS. So basically, yeah, uh, there are the two players in this uh, game. Let's, let's call it game. It's a very, very terrible game. Let's uh, examine a little bit the role of Vladimir Putin that uh, at the moment is the new Hitler for a side, uh, is a savior for the other side. We know, of course, that every war is wrong. Absolutely. So he... Uh, if he had any reason before the war, he is now wrong, 100% wrong. So I we blame any kind of war. Uh, can you, uh, for example, uh, the role of Putin uh, with the, the connection with the work, uh, World Economic Forum? If I show you this, for example, this is a very short... Uh, this guy... Uh, also, I remember that these guys appearing here uh, this guy, this guy is Klaus Schwab, and uh, in this video, there is from 2021, so it's very recent. It's one year, one year ago, basically. Mr. Schwab, dear colleagues, dear Klaus, I visited the. Dear Klaus. Dear Klaus, <laughs> oh, they are friends, very, very friends. <laughs> and uh, dear Klaus is also a friend of Trudeau, is a friend of Merkel, is a friend of uh, many, 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 half of the government, apparently, of Canada, your country. Sorry, I have Mario Draghi, so we are <laughs> <laughs> no, not much better. <laughs> not much better so, uh, can, can I have a comment about uh, Vladimir Putin, if you don't mind, please? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for setting that up and putting the context in there. So it's important to understand, for example, there was recently a video that went uh, around quite a bit online of Klaus Schwab speaking a couple of years ago, talking about uh, Justin Trudeau and various other governments and saying that the World Economic Forum had penetrated governments around the world by populating the various cabinets with World Economic Forum young global leaders. And he listed a number of people in positions, including... Vladimir Putin. Now, as many people have pointed out, it is almost certain that Vladimir Putin was not part of this World Economic Forum Young Global Leaders Program because in that time in the early 1990s, he was 41 years old um, and too old to have been actually a member of the program, which I believe was has an age cap of 38. I have to look up the exact numbers, but it was something along those lines. So when Klaus Schwab said Putin was a one of the young global leaders, he was almost certainly lying or at least mistaken. Um, having said that, uh, you've shown that 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 little clip, but there are there are many others um, that indicate that Putin was very much uh, I, I won't say uh, I mean, how can you address the friendship of someone like Putin and Schwab, but certainly friendly and cordial. And uh, there were many, 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 many such meetings and uh, and conferences, which Putin was glad to attend and contribute to. And um, they have, uh, Schwab has talked about his friendship with Putin going back to the 1990s. Um, some people will counter that by saying, oh, but you know, Putin's a world leader and all world leaders just have to do these types of things. But I ask those people whether they would take, say, a Justin Trudeau or someone else's word for it. Oh, you know, they're just a, it's just a world leader. You just got to talk to people like Schwab and whatever. It's, it's, it's unfortunately, I see a lot of the same types of defenses going on for Putin's role in constructing a new world order that I saw a, a few years ago amongst the Trump crowd of people saying Trump was fighting the globalists and he was going to save the world and he's going to round them all up and everything's going to be better. Meanwhile, that. he was yeah, the yeah, one yeah. who stewarded in and shepherded over COVID-19 response in the United States, including the warp speed operation to make sure the new mRNA vaccines were warp speeded into everyone's veins as quickly as possible, something that he said was one of the greatest accomplishments in human history. So I think that puts into perspective, oh, maybe maybe these people who were telling me Trump was such a great anti-globalist crusader were not just wrong, but ridiculously, horribly wrong. And I think they are also wrong about Putin. Do not look at simply he shook hands with Schwab. Look at the fact he has a close personal friendship 
with Kissinger, invites him to his home for dinner uh, every time he's in Moscow. These people collaborate on a very deep level and have great respect and admiration for each other, which they express at multiple opportunities. But beyond that, even look at what Putin says about the creation of the new multipolar world order, which we uh, are being psyoped, I think, in the independent media into thinking is the alternative to the global unipolar world order. Either you are for the US and NATO and its proxies ruling over the world, or you are for Russia and China and others creating this new multipolar world where everyone has a seat at the table and it's all just about you know, respecting each other's sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. But if you listen to what Putin actually says and actually writes, you will see that he, uh, on multiple occasions, says that he is looking towards the creation of a real United Nations-led Sustainable Development Agenda 2030 world order, where nations will work together on key topics like pandemic prevention and uh, and uh, creation of technological infrastructure for the fourth industrial revolution and things along these lines. Of course, Russia just wants to be a main seat at that table of world power. That is, that is essentially the difference we are being offered is a US-led world order or a Russia, China, India, whoever led world order. Uh, I think I actually don't want partic to participate in either vision of quote unquote world order, which is really a type of world disorder. Um, I think real order, natural order, spontaneous order happens at the horizontal level. It is not top down imposed on people. That is uh, authoritarian rule. And that I think is the way we have to understand Putin and Trudeau and everyone else, Draghi and everyone else in this game is they are all playing the same game, which is an authoritarian game to try to control populations. And the Russian government is trying to control its citizenry in the exact same way that every other country on the planet is trying to control its citizenry. A good example is the recent uh, ruling from the Russian government that uh, you uh, they, they uh, are trying to criminalize media outlets from calling what is happening right now a war. They, the, uh, I think, I believe the, um, the, the, proper terminology is a special military operation and media outlets in Russia are literally being forbidden from calling it war. Now, regardless of what you think is or is not happening, uh, what would we say if say Trudeau started setting, putting, threatening journalists with jail time, if they said, well, if you call, if you, if you say what happened in Canada was tyrannical, we'll throw you in jail. Everyone would rightly call that authoritarianism out. But people in, for some reason, at least in the English speaking independent media, seem to never, ever, ever call out Putin for his authoritarianism. And I, I think that is very, very much to our detriment because we are going to be led once again into some sort of Trump like operation where this anti globalist crusader is going to save us. Oh, wait, no, he isn't. Oh, it's too late. And unfortunately, the stakes get raised every single time this happens. In the Trump era, it was bad enough. In the Putin era, it will be even worse because we really are looking at the specter of a World War III in the 2D chess game, which means war of nation state versus nation state. But as I constantly point out, World War III is already begun and it is a war of every nation against its own citizens to try to control them more thoroughly. And no one is a better example of that than Putin's good pal Xi Jinping there in China, controlling the citizenry through a te technological surveillance grid, the likes of which could could hardly have been imagined even a generation ago. That is the vision for the new world order that the BRICS and everyone else is looking to bring about. Yeah, the social credit, and all, the, all the stuff that we in the Western countries, we see it in the Black Mirror episode and we, oh my God, this is terrible, it's terrible. But then they wanted it during the COVID thing. And uh, yeah, they will push it until they get it. And uh, we know that they, they will insist and insist. Actually, you remind me uh, when you said about the new savior, uh, Donald Trump, the new savior uh, against the system and Putin, they are portraying him as the same anti-system, anti-elite uh, that he's doing. Absolutely, you're out of, <laughs> absolutely, you're out of range. It's not like that. It's something else. It's completely something else. And uh, actually, uh, when people were telling me, ah, Trump will do, we will do this, uh, Trump will bring America back again, I would say Trump is just uh, Richard Berlusconi.
he's a coward seller of uh, uh, vacuum cleaners okay uh, it's nothing more than that and uh, i think uh, <laughs> um, that somebody like that uh, you wouldn't expect to save you believe me absolutely not it will save itself only we are talking about Klaus Schwab, that is the leader of the World Economic Forum, that wrote many books about the new the for, uh, the, the new uh, industrial age, as you stated before, the integration of uh, human beings with technology, the, con the total control of the people uh, through violent, uh, terrible means. Um, can you give me a hint about the about uh, according with your research uh, for how long did they plan the, this whole plan? I mean, this. I think it's an important step. The war in Ukraine is an important step of the greater set after the COVID thing. And also the fact that the COVID disappeared in many places in the world now. So can you give us a hint about their plan? After COVID, there is the war. And what's next? When did it start? Can you give a hint, please? Yes. All right. So it's a very good question, but it's a very big question. So if we want to look specifically at the World Economic Forum and its role in it, I would suggest people look at my website. I did a piece on the Great Reset. Um, uh, I can't remember what the title of that was. The uh, <laughs> Uh, explaining the Great Reset, whatever it was called. Just look up Great Reset on my site. I did a podcast episode on that. Also look up uh, the World Economic Forum. I did a podcast episode about that and its origins and what, how it operates, etc. So there's a lot of context there. Um, if we're looking specifically at the nature of the Great Reset itself, as I've been stressing for the past couple of years, I think this is just a rebranding of a very old idea, essentially that new world order that I was referring to um, before. Um, which is essentially the idea of t perfect top-down control of society uh, managed in a technocratic fashion. So technocracy being an idea that's been kicking around for the better part of a century now of uh, rule by an elite scientific and technical class. But what that story, I think, leaves out, the operative part is that elite scientific and technical class is being funded by someone. And I think it is the funders who ultimately will control that society. So um, having said that, uh, you could, for example, follow the thread of the Great Reset uh, through the World Economic Forum back into the World Economic Forum's founding in the 1970s, the early 1970s. And I believe it was, the, if not the inaugural, perhaps the second uh, edition of the Davos Conference, which at that time was, I believe, referred to as the European Management Forum. Um, but the one of the key addresses at that at the same time, they were adopting what they called the Davos Manifesto, um, talking about the agenda, essentially, of the world, what would become the World Economic Forum. One of the speakers was uh, Aurelio Pache, who, uh, as you might know, was one of the founding members of the Club of Rome, which at that time was putting together what would become the, uh, the Limits to Growth, which was this document about how we're running out of everything, we're running out of resources, the world is going to hell, we're all going to die. So what we need is stronger world global governmental systems in place and a more thoroughly uh, top-down control of the planet by fewer people in order to carefully steward over our resources and manage us into this new neo-feudal era. And again, I think that's just that e even in a, of itself, 50 years ago with the limits to growth, I think that was just a rebranding of a very old idea that's been around since you could argue the early development of the environmental movement and, and conservation movement going back to the 1920s and 30s um, and even 1910s as we know it today. But all of those people who helped to found and promote that movement at that time were all literal card-carrying eugenicists. So then you have to look at the, the uh, ideology of eugenics, the idea that certain people by virtue of their genes are fit to rule over other human beings. And we should encourage these people to breed together and stop those criminals and insane and feeble-minded people and everyone we don't like, the poor people and others from breeding. Um, so that idea um, took off in the late, late 19th and early 20th century. But even that was just a rebrand of old ideas about say the divine right of kings. God has chosen certain families to rule over other people. You could follow that even further back to the Pharaoh and uh, the emperor in China. This is literally God on earth. This person is literally divine and thus deserves to rule over other people. So I think you can follow this thread back literally thousands of years into the earliest uh, uh, murky origins of recorded human history, at least as we know it today. So there's a lot to go through there. But as I say, I, 
if we understand it in that context, we understand that what's happening today is not fundamentally different than what we have um, uh, experienced for centuries, if not millennia in human history. There are a very few people, an oligarchical clique, that want to rule over as many people as possible. And understanding it in that context makes the, the machinations of what David Rothkopf um, has referred to as the superclass. Uh, he wrote a book back in 2008 ad identifying there were about 6,000 individuals who are uh, transnational actors who uh, 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 supersede, who transcend the nation state system. And they are able to enact an international agenda despite not being, well, not all of them anyway, being actual politicians or in positions of political power, but we're talking about corporate chieftains, uh, financial uh, wizards, and uh, and and I, I wouldn't even know how to describe someone like a Henry Kissinger right now. He hasn't been in government for 40 plus years, but he's still obviously influential on a number of people who are in positions of power. So people like that, part of this super class that gets to fly around the world, going to the Davos and Bilderberg meetings and other meetings besides, tr essentially trying to carve out the planet and uh, decide what happens to it. So that is what is essentially happening. And when we put it in that context, we can see very clearly the game plan going forward from here. It's no big secret. They openly tell people about it and brag about it, but they have given it nice words like sustainable development. So we have the sustainable development goals that are being put forward for the 2030 agenda being um, run through the auspices of the United Nations, which is this vision of the planet that I suppose if you're reading it in a completely gullible manner and just taking it at completely at face value, a lot of it sounds quite good. It's about the eradication of poverty and education for everyone and all of these things that most people would tend to agree with. Okay, this sounds good. But the devil is always in the details. And when you drill down on the details, you start to find some very, very disturbing things embedded in a lot of these ideas that are being forwarded right now. For example, one I've pointed to before, I'll point to it here again. Sustainable Development Goal 16.9 is about... Uh, uh, by 2030, everyone on the planet will have the wonderful right bestowed on them, the right to identity. You have the right to, uh, to have a legal identity so that you can prove who you are. Therefore, you can access government services and all those wonderful things that flow from it. What that actually means when you start to drill down on it, though, is you start to look at groups like ID2020 that have corporate partners like Microsoft and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other players like that, that are starting to construct a digital identification web that then nexus is into, say, the vaccine agenda, which obviously we've seen the rollout during this COVID era. And we start to find out that, oh, the vaccine passports and the green passes and other things that are being instituted right now are a part of a plan that has been developed for years now and been talked about in white papers and conferences uh, for people in the know. Um, a part of a plan to provide digital ID for every person on the planet so that they can be then placed into digital blockchains that can then be uh, understood and, and tracked and eventually, of course, tied into social credit, tied into actual credit, uh, like central bank digital currencies will be tied into digital identification, will be tied into your biomedical history. All of these things are converging. This is, the, I think, the idea of the fourth industrial revolution. As Klaus Schwab has said a number of times, it's about merging your physical, biological, and digital identities. And then that will be trackable, traceable, controllable at all times by the very few people in this superclass who are seeking to steward over humanity. I don't know about you, but once it's framed in that way, to me, that is the stuff of nightmares. I do not see anything good about a very small number of people having the ability to say, turn off your ability to buy and sell at the flip of a switch because, oh, you're, you're an insurrectionist. Oh, look at you were part of that trucker convoy. That's it. We're turning the lights off on you. And that will be possible in the very near future if this Agenda 2030 happens and the great resetters get their way. In your documentary, The 5G Dragnet, you speak about technocracy. Uh, Inc. Uh, there was a book of a person from the 30s. I don't remember exactly the name now, but in the book was stating, because I translated the job as well, and uh, I was stating that uh, they needed the control of every uh, item that was uh, purchased, produced, uh, sold, uh, 
and, and needs to be tracked uh, in a um, real-time way. Only this is the way we can have the technocracy. Back then in, in the 30s, that was basically sci-fi. There was a <laughs> sci-fi book. I mean, it's uh, uh, Jules Verne or something like that. I mean, it wasn't possible. Today, it is possible. And uh, it, is, it is actually ongoing. And uh, actually, I would like to connect something else from your beautiful production, something that we published in our website. The World War One Conspiracy uh, is a beautiful documentary about World War One that started the series of fightings and war during the century, that's the 20th century. And uh, it's an amazing, uh, you made me think of this documentary uh, when you spoke about the circle, the, because in, the, in this documentary you mentioned about the, was forming a society, a secret society uh, in the style of Jesuits. So with an inner circle that was controlling everything and an outer circle that was uh, even aware of the existence of the inner circle. So uh, how can we connect uh, the power of today with uh, the power of the 20th century of World War One, World War II, because they are both connected <laughs> to the wars, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, I would like to have uh, uh, your uh, expert opinion about uh, these uh, topics since you made this amazing documentary. I very much see an historical continuity stretching back. I mean, you could go, I'm sure, much further back, but I've gone at least as far back to the late 19th century. If you look at my How and Why Big Oil Conquered the World documentary, I think that's another piece of history that's incredibly important to understand the context of what we're living through today. And I think that ties into that World War I conspiracy, which, um, as you state, um, goes through, for example, the creation by uh, Cecil Rhodes of a round table um, secret society that was, as as uh, was documented, was specifically modeled on the Jesuit order, but was, uh, in Cecil Rhodes' vision, was meant to form a secret society that would further the, the extent of the British Empire and essentially make the British Empire a ruling power among the globe. And interestingly, it was in... At that time, when Cecil Rhodes was first formulating this in the late 19th century, the vision was essentially for a U.S. slash Britain run world order. And the, you know, there, there was this order that was being uh, uh, thought about where Washington would have the world capital for some time, London would have, and it would trade back and forth. It was a, a strange vision, I think, to a lot of the, the people in the world. But at any rate, uh, it was something that Cecil Rhodes believed in. And some of he uh, had some acolytes and some people around him, probably because of his immense wealth, um, that he was able to uh, bring on board with this idea. But that idea quickly morphed and got sort of taken over after his death and moved into this. Uh, essentially, it continued to function as a secret society, but started to move in different directions. And one of those was towards the the, the the formation of what would become World War I. And I go through that history in that documentary. But one of the things that happened after World War I, and if you watch the World War I conspiracy, you will note that it ends with to be continued, dot, dot, dot. And I have, I have, I do have a plan to continue that documentary. Um, I was I going wait. to do so. <laughs> I was going I to do wait. so in 2020, but uh, unfortunately other things happened too take over the news cycle. So I've, I've been distracted, but I will get back to that. But if you follow that story forward, of course, immediately in the wake of World War I, there was the Paris uh, Peace Accords and, and the, the, uh, the Versailles Conference. Um, and it was in that time when so many of the different world leaders and, and, and their various diplomats and hangers-on and, and, and functionaries were in Paris that certain groups started to coalesce, including one that became the basis for what was called the Royal Institute for International Affairs in England. And it had spinoffs all throughout the, the Commonwealth of Great Britain, but also in the United States, it took the form of the Council on Foreign Relations. And that, yeah, okay. that was a direct result of that World War I and that what became uh, uh, as a result of that. And it was the CFR that in World War II, actually during World War II, before it was even over, was already starting to plan the formation of a United Nations and what that new global order would look like after World War II. And you can trace that through the, say, example, Henry Kissinger and people like that, who then became the mentor of someone like Klaus Schwab, 
So the, I think there is a, a document. It would be fairly straightforward to document connections all the way through. And as I say, the underlying guiding ideology of world control in the hands of a very few, I think, is the is the connecting thread that ties all of this together. Absolutely agree. Yeah, no, no, the, there's a lot of uh, obscurity around uh, the, the facts of World War One, uh, and they're still coming out new facts every every day. Today, basically, they are de uh, desecrating a lot of documents. Uh, I think in 2014, when it was 100 years after, uh, they discovered the Lusitania, for example, was full of uh, of explosive and uh, and uh, shells for the for the artillery in uh, in Europe. So basically, was participating to the war. Therefore, was a threat for the Germany, and the Germany actually advised uh, to not take the ship. So they, they was, took out literal ads in the newspaper saying, yeah. "Do not take the ship." So yeah. yeah, it wasn't exactly a sneak surprise attack. But Woodrow Wilson wasn't that uh, great politician, I think. In the end, uh, absolutely no. Uh, he was a, a, prof a professor of uh, from Princeton, right? Yes, yes, I think. Right. And it was uh, basically unknown before, uh, as you stated in your your documentary. It was basically taken from 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 nowhere. He <laughs> was uh, not known. They had to build this character that he was basically completely uh, lacking of any charisma or uh, you know. Uh, so it was a perfect uh, maneuverable person. Uh, now I have to go to a, a, a topic that is no longer uh, uh, on top of our uh, COVID. So I wanted to ask you, uh, since you live abroad, uh, and also it's a, an interesting, I think, uh, point of view from a person, you know, uh, not Italian, for the Italian people, what's the perception of, of Italy about the COVID measures, uh, Mario Draghi, whatever, as a person living abroad? What do you think about Italy? What's the, what's the rumor that has it? I mean... Uh, just to have this uh, opinion from you. Well, obviously, as I don't need to tell you, Italy was the epicenter of COVID as it started to move international. And so it was at that time in early 2020 that I think all eyes were on Italy and on specifically on the actions and reactions that were taking place there with regards to locking places down, locking down sections of the country. You can't travel from this section of the country to that section of the country without special dispensation. It was crazy. It was truly crazy to watch that happening. And it was at that point that I think it became very apparent that they were pulling the trigger on medical martial law, essentially, what I've been talking about for over a decade now, that this, this vision of a, a sort of medical tyranny was coming into view and it started to coalesce there in Italy. So I did do some specific work on Italy um, in the early days of this so-called pandemic. What's up with the Italian mortality rate was an episode of Questions for Corbett where I did a, a, a fairly deep dive, at least at that time in late March of last year, as to the question of, well, it, Italy, there's something happening and there's a spike in mortality. So what is happening and what can we attribute to it? So I, I went through a number of the possibilities and, and talked about um, different problems with attributing the deaths to COVID, et cetera. And some of the things that I think have become quite standard over um, the last couple of years, but and are, and are finally now being admitted in the mainstream. Well, how we code these deaths, you know, maybe a problem as to how they're being recorded, etc. Um, uh, I, I note also the, the massacre of Italy's elderly nursing home residents, uh, an article from, say, TRT World, where Again, they go through the types of things that happened in many different places, like the sudden spike in deaths in New York, which similarly, they were taking COVID diagnosed patients and shoving them into nursing homes and essentially letting them fend for themselves until they died. And oh, they're dying. Wow. What an amazing wow. uh, thing to, to watch. So um, it was, I think it was definitely the bellwether. And I have seen some of the protests and and uh, kickback as uh, to against the vaccine mandates and passes and things in. Well, I was watching that before Ukraine took over the news, and now we yeah. suddenly yeah. forgot COVID ever happened. So of I don't course. know the latest state of what's happening in Italy, but uh, I think it still is something that people have their eye on. And it's in that context because specifically because Italy was, I think, the first country outside of China where it started to gain attention is why it's perhaps not surprising to me, or at least it makes some sort of sense to me, that the person who best coalesced and crystallized the various ideas I had about um, medical martial law into a single word, biosecurity, was Giorgio Agamben. 
of course, um, as you will know in Italy, but um, maybe not so many people know in America and Canada and Japan and other places, but he has absolutely done some incredibly important work and uh, given some incredibly important interviews and lectures about this phenomenon over the past couple of years. And I'm very glad to have discovered him in the past couple of years because I recognize he is a very profoundly deep thinker on these things and not afraid to go into places that are forbidden for, I think, most of e even academics at this point. And very uncomfortable, I will, I will say. Because uh, if you say something like uh, what uh, Giorgio Gambin said, you will be isolated, you will be, uh, of course, you will become uh, the Novax, uh, the, uh, has been attacked from every part of it, every, every, every TV show, any, any kind of uh, attack to a Gambin was allowed. Uh, he was uh, uh, actually he disappeared recently after um, for a while. He was attacked for a, for a long, long time and can be tough. Something I wanted to show you is another thing that honestly concerned me when when he started all this thing, especially for the vaccine thing. Is uh, this guy is uh, in charge of the vaccination of Italy? Uh, this is a general of the army of the Alpine Corps. So. Um, I honestly, I have a theory about the shows of this guy. Why? The Alpine Corps, uh, you say, why? Why the Alpine Corps? Uh, because they, in the official uh, uh, history of Italy, there is false, um, because it was discovered it was false. Uh, the Alpine Corps didn't lose a war since uh, they, was, they were created. In World War I, they won. Uh, in World War II, uh, they always claim there was a Russian communication during the invasion of Russia because Italian troops, of course, helped Hitler. We sent the 8th Army with, under uh, Gen General Garibaldi and it was destroyed by the Russians. And uh, uh, the Italian Army uh, invented this uh, uh, proclamation from the Russian Army saying that the Alpine Corps were not defeated. They were captured, but they were not defeated. It's just a theory of myself, honestly. Maybe it's stupid, but it's, a, it's another reason of using propaganda. You know, uh, when you yeah. use the military, uh, the, the, this guy was in charge. Uh, the first uh, in Brescia, the city of Brescia is in northern Italy, is uh, the epicenter of, uh, you probably remember the name of the city, uh, in Brescia and Bergamo, very close cities. And uh, there was a lot of deaths. And uh, then when it started, you know, the, the outbreak. And uh, when they basically, uh, we were in lockdown for a few days. Uh, the hospital started to gather the coffins because there were not uh, funeral home open, of course. So they gathered some coffins because people in hospital die. It's normal. And there were 150 coffins. I still remember the number because they used 50 military trucks to transport 150 coffins. And guess what? They did they pass around the city and go to the places we're heading to? No, they passed to the city center, showing all the people this uh, march of death. Honestly, when I saw this display from the military, I said, something is wrong here. Something is very wrong in my country, by the way. So I was very worried. Uh, I live in Dublin, uh, so um, I, I, I didn't go to Italy since 2020, basically. So I... Uh, it's a terrible thing for a person living abroad. And I think you can understand me because you probably don't see your your homeland for a while, I guess. I don't see my mother for three years. So Yeah, it's been, I think, four years since I've been in Canada. Four years. So we're on the same page on the same boat. Uh, OK, um, next question is about exactly Canada and the tracker movements. What's the point of view of a Canadian citizen like yourself? About the movements of the trackers that was uh, uh, so victorious at the start, occupied basically Ottawa for 10 or 12 days, I don't remember the number of days, and then they brutally uh, removed by the police, uh, their bank accounts were blocked. Uh, oh my God. Uh, what's your point of view about this protest? Right. Well, uh, <laughs> if you're looking for the Canadian point of view, I'm probably doubly the wrong person to ask because not only have I lived in Japan for 18 years now, so <laughs> somewhat disconnected from Canadian uh, everyday life, but also because I, doing what I do, obviously I look at this information from a certain perspective. I hear from certain types of people, so I, I guess I'm not 
the sort of everyday average Joe, and I don't know what the average person is thinking with regards to these events, but I can see, I, I, I certainly have heard from many people, not only people in my audience who obviously understand that something deeply wrong has happened over the past couple of years, but more importantly, them seeing many, many people around them being supportive of what's happening and coming out to these various, uh, for example, to see the convoy as it was passing through or to various protests that are happening now. Um, sometimes thousands of people gathering in various cities, um, marching and, and protesting the mandates. It has, uh, according to many people that I've talked to, um, been very invigorating, energizing. It was an extremely important thing to happen. Um, I think after two years of people basically being beaten down and told they're all alone, and if you don't go along with this, you're crazy, I think it was very much needed for people to come together in an identifiable, visible way to show we are not some weird fringe minority and we're not all Nazis or whatever just because we do not want vaccine mandates. In fact, quite the opposite. We're against authoritarianism. So that was, at any rate, a very positive development. Now, the reaction from the Canadian government to this trucker convoy was absolutely insane. And I think really did go too far too fast, even for the people who were inclined to be on the government side. And, well, we need these mandates to get through a medical situation. I think everyone is a little bit taken aback by the idea of freezing people out of their bank accounts, cutting off, canceling their credit cards and other things for participating in or uh, ha losing their jobs simply for donating to, sometimes $40 donating to the trucker convoy and, and people have lost their jobs over this. It is an insane, hysterical reaction that I think, hopefully, if, I, if this doesn't, I think, wake up Canadians on a mass scale, I really don't know what will. And unfortunately, I know there will be some people who go along with this, but a lot of people are really questioning what's happening now and where this goes. So... Although it is a horrible thing what has happened, I think it can have a positive effect in terms of getting people to really start, for at the very least, questioning when they start rolling out the central bank digital currencies, where they will literally be able to turn off your ability to, to buy or sell if you, for example, participate in a freedom convoy or something along those lines. I think people will at least be a little more cautious and... The, uh, the idea that it's some crazed conspiracy theory that you're going to be put on some sort of list for protesting, well, that won't be tenable anymore because it's already happened. And as I pointed out in a recent episode, I was reading uh, a piece from the CBC, the main broadcaster there in Canada, just a few weeks before all of that rolled out, where they were noting with some degree of derision that, oh, some people, a lot of people are trying to donate to this at that time, the GoFundMe campaign for the trucker convoy. They're trying to donate anonymously, like they're scared they're going to be put on some sort of government watch list. Ha ha ha. Well, a, a few weeks later, I guarantee you those same people who were deriding and laughing at that idea were fully on board with those people being put on a government watch list. And it's a good thing. So I think Again, anyone who is truly looking at this can see through the propaganda, and it's just a question of how many people are looking through this and what they're going to do about it. So I, I think it's a very exciting time and could be truly a turning point in all of this. But again, it's it really depends on what we make of this. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree 100% with you. I, will, I have a, a one last question for you, and then I'll let you go. Uh, so... Uh, the topic became a little bit popular recently because we are worried for Ukraine, of course. Uh, since we worried for eight years, eight years of war there, we didn't care. And now we worry about uh, Ukraine, of course. But by the way, uh, COVID is still a thing in Italy. Uh, and a vaccinated person in Italy cannot even take a bus, public bus. So uh, can I have an advice from you for the, for the Italian people that didn't get uh, the experimental uh, Elysir and uh, they want uh, to survive? Uh, unfortunately, there's no magic wand that I can wave to, uh, to change what's happening. Um, I am doing a Solutions Watch series where every week I'm looking at various aspects of things that people can be doing and and even examining what things people should or should not be doing. Is this a good tactic? Will this work? So for example, uh, I've talked about um, protests against vaccine mandates in the past. Um, and I believe I did mention Italy specifically uh, it, with regards to that. But I, I just recently did an episode on our protests and petitions, the answer 
in which I'm looking at uh, are these are are we looking for some sort of political solution here? Uh, can we bring lawsuits? You know, are are these effective means of changing what's happening right now? And ultimately, I come to the conclusion that although I don't think they are fundamentally the answer to this problem, they can perhaps be an answer. And and if there is significant political pushback and protest and what have you, politicians might at the very least lay off a little bit and drop some of the mandates here and there. It's not the solution going forward for all time, but at least it can help improve people's lives. But I think the solution really involves the creation of a parallel economy. Truly, truly creating something, a, a system whereby people can interact with each other with, without the permission of government, without government coming in and saying what they can and cannot do. Now, that is a monumental task that is very, we are very, very far away from that. But there are things that people can start doing to start building up that economy. And the first thing people need to start doing is meeting with and connecting with like-minded people. And I don't mean, well, online, sure, okay, yes, but also in the real world, more importantly, in the real world, forming actual communities of like-minded people and using that as a base to start constructing, at the very least, basic emergency systems of, well, if the food supply, if the, we're suddenly shut off from the food supply, if we suddenly can't you know, uh, buy things at the store, will we be able to take care of ourselves and each other? And starting those types of survival communities, essentially, and then building them up, connecting them together and forming a parallel economy. And I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not, uh, uh, you know, some utopian visionary. This is all going to turn out perfectly happy and nothing. No, of course, at the precise moment that those types of communities really start forming and start making a difference is the precise moment the governments will start cracking down on them. These are insurrectionists. This will be essentially a battle. But that's what I keep stressing over and over in my work recently. We are in a war. The governments are declaring that people who are going to try to find self-sufficiency, who are going to try to get out from under the thumb of this coming fourth industrial revolution, are the enemy in a war. And they will paint you as insurrectionists for even daring to suggest that we should drop our vaccine mandates. I, it's just absolute insanity. So I'm not expecting this to be easy or to happen overnight. But we need to start connecting communities together of real people in the real world who can help to start to take care of each other. Absolutely agree. That's the key, I think. The only, the only solution is creating a parallel uh, everything, basically. And having a replacement, uh, you know, uh, if uh, the, the supermarket uh, won't let you in, uh, you have like... Uh, the grocery store uh, in the basement of the house of the guy that is absolutely clandestine and uh, is absolutely black market and uh, of course it will be probably the new offspring of a new uh, generation of black markets uh, out of the state uh, illegal uh, like pro prohibition uh, it's insane it's absolutely insane <laughs> definitely exciting exactly <laughs> i love the t-shirt it's amazing i love the t-shirt please send me the link uh, where we can uh, uh, purchase this because i, I will do i'll give the plug right here it's agorathreads.com but i'll send you the link too yes please send me the link i will put it in, in the show notes okay i will take a few days to publish this uh, this episode thank you so much james for uh, being our guest it's a great honor for me and uh, it's great for the Italian uh, audience as well. Do you have a last word before we hang up? I think we've covered quite a bit of ground and there's a, I know that for people who are perhaps hearing some of this for the first time, it's obviously overwhelming. So uh, it, I, I always, as I say, I always try to source what I am saying and provide links to documents so people can read it for themselves because I, that was the way that I came to this information. It wasn't listening to someone just telling me what was happening. It was me starting to look for and discover this information. I think we're at a point where you'd have to be almost purposefully putting your head in the sand not to not to be curious and not to look into this information at the very least to verify or or uh, uh, debunk it for yourself and i invite people to do that so go to corbettreport.com that's my website and from there you can find 15 years now of archives of material on these subjects like the world war 1 conspiracy and other things that we've mentioned today and i hope people will at least 
take a look at it. It's all there for free viewing and listening. And I always put up source notes and, and transcripts for my documentaries and what have you. Take a look at the information and see if it's useful for you. And uh, if it is, then I hope to, uh, you'll perhaps join me and, and uh, uh, you'll be listening to me again in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, James. Thank you so much. So I will put in the show notes a few links for you. Uh, a greetings for our audience. Uh, I will uh, switch to Italian. Grazie a tutti per averci seguito come Don Quixote incontra. Al prossimo episodio. Grazie a tutti e buonanotte.